All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Good to be here with you all. Uh, missed you the past couple weeks. I was out on a little bit of a quarantine, but <laughs> I'm officially back now. So good to be good to be gathered here with you all. For those of you I haven't met, my name's Trevor. Uh, I serve here as one of the pastors in the center region, and uh, joy to be with you all this morning. And uh, thanks for the intro, Andrew. Okay, if you would, go ahead and grab a Bible and open up to the book of Acts, chapter 16, uh, or navigate on your devices to the book of Acts, chapter 16, if you're working on something digital. We're going to be hanging out, as Andrew said, in verses 25 to 34 of Acts chapter 16 today. So that's where we'll be camping out. So go ahead and make your way there. And really the idea that I'm looking to explore together this morning is, uh, is just this, that you are where you are for a reason. All right, if you believe that, let me get an amen this morning. You are where you are for a reason. And I do want to acknowledge that uh, you may or may not be feeling that way this particular morning. This may or may not be your experience in this season of life that you found yourself in. But I think what we'll see as we look through this passage together is that uh, very clearly you are where you are for a reason. And so that's what we're gonna be exploring together as we work through this passage. And as we do so, we got a table of contents, a couple of points we're gonna be working through. We have these two, a midnight song and a well-built bridge. A midnight song and a well-built bridge. That's what we're gonna be uh, going this morning. So with that, let's go ahead and jump into the first point now. And uh, as usual, just in getting a feel for the context, we're gonna pull up a map here and uh, get, a, get a, just situated with where we're at in the book of Acts. So we've been going through the first or second missionary journey, which is that red squiggly line. That's what that's uh, describing there. And at this point in the journey, Paul has moved out of the region of Asia Minor, crossed the Mediterranean Sea there, and he's in the region of Macedonia up on the top left part of the map. And uh, in chapter 16 in particular, we get three stories of what happens while Paul is in the city of Philippi. And uh, Josh Laxton, he, he shared uh, the past couple weeks on the first two stories of what took place with the woman named Lydia who comes to faith and then also the slave girl. Uh, and then this week we're picking up with the, the third story, which is the man called the Philippian jailer and what takes place with him. So uh, that's what we're looking at. And if you remember, Right from the very beginning in Philippi, everything seems to be going really well for them, right? Everything is going good for uh, Paul and Silas. You know, this vision had brought them to Macedonia. They're in Philippi. Lydia's coming to faith. They're sharing the gospel. Everything is going great. And then it takes a sudden downward twist as they upset some people in the city. Uh, and very quickly, and in a very public and humiliating fashion, they are arrested. They're stripped naked and they are beaten severely. And to make matters worse, after that, they're taken to prison uh, and they're locked in something called the inner cell, which is uh, where low ventilation, it's pitch black. And as uh, was often the case, as was the case with Paul and Silas even, the prisoners' feet were locked in these stocks that restricted their movement, removing any possibility of comfort uh, or moving around at all. And so you can kind of see like, that, that things were going well, and then all of a sudden they just went horribly. And, and if you're in their shoes, you're probably thinking to yourself, well, what, what happened? Like, it seemed pretty clear that God said, this is where we were supposed to go. We're meant to be here. And we came and everything was going well at first, but now everything is terrible, right? And and you can almost imagine what their emotional state might be, what they'd be feeling in the midst of this as they're wrestling with this situation, especially considering they never even had a chance to defend themselves. They were never even given a trial. It all just happened. And, but what's striking about this story is not, not even so much the degree to which they were mistreated, but it's that even in the midst of such circumstances, their response was still one of faith of leaning into God in the midst of the difficulty. And what we'll see as we pick up the passage together is exactly what that response was. And so if you meet me in verse 25 of Acts chapter 16, uh, we'll pick it up there, verse 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. About midnight, in the middle of this inner cell, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening 
to them. All right, there's plenty for us to get to in this passage this morning, and we'll move on from this. But before we do, I want to camp out with this verse a little bit, because I almost don't know what's more surprising about this, that in the midst of these circumstances, they're not only praying, but they're singing to God, right? I mean, it's, it's pitch black. It's the middle of the night. They're uh, exhausted. They're uncomfortable. They're locked in these stocks, so they can't even move around. They can't even stretch out, right? They're, they're in pain. And they have no promise of a release ahead of them. And yet, even in the midst of these circumstances, they're praying and they're singing to God. I don't know about you, but but I find that response remarkable. But the other thing is what this passage shows us, what even this verse points out, is that this remarkable response that they're able to have is by no means going unnoticed. But the other prisoners... We're listening, which I think should lead us to conclude, even at this early part of the story, that they were in this prison, Paul and Silas, for a reason. That maybe they wouldn't have chosen it, and I'm not saying that they enjoyed it, but they were where they were for a reason, and that included the difficulties, which I think should lead us to understand, even when it comes to our own lives, that wherever you happen to be in life, You are where you are for a reason. And that includes far more about our lives than what we would probably even want or desire. Because again, that includes the difficulties. That includes the job that you can't stand. That that includes the, the apartment you wish you had never signed a lease for. That includes... Uh, even, even things that have to do with health. It includes the struggle with infertility. That includes the diagnosis that you hoped would never come. And it includes the loss. Because no matter where you happen to be in life or what what your circumstances happen to be, what this passage is showing us is that you are where you are for a reason. And and just to be clear, I'm not trying to say that, that God is the one who is orchestrating your pain or... Or that even in the midst of it, you just need to, you know, kind of suppress what you're feeling and pray, give God praise and sing for the sake of being a good witness. I'm not just saying count it all joy for the sake of the gospel because it was always meant to be anyways. But what I am saying is that God is able to redeem whatever situation you're going through and that he intends to work through it as we lean into him in the midst of it. Because what the scriptures teach us to do and what Paul and Silas are actually doing here is they're not just ignoring what they're feeling. They're not just suppressing the difficulty and the pain, but they're praying and they're singing as a way to lean into God in the midst of it. And that's actually how we count it all joy, not by ignoring what we're going through, but by leaning into God and walking with him in the midst of it for strength and for him to sustain us. Because you know, even this past weekend, um, or even just yesterday, one of our, one of our pastors here, Ralph, uh, his, his wife of 38 years, Chris, um, After an 18 month long battle with cancer, she passed away and we had our funeral service here yesterday, the wake on Friday. And I know many of you were able to, to come out or at least to watch online. And, uh, it was just a powerful service. It was beautiful, right? The the testimony of, of her life and the way that she cared for so many people, the way that she pointed so many people to Christ and how they, they received the love of Christ through her and the relationship that they had with her in a way that they really needed. It was powerful. And even as Ralph shared in the midst of the service that even through these past 18 months, which have been incredibly painful, that even in the worst of those moments, that they could always see God's hand upon the situation and his kindness and his faithfulness to them and the way that he was strengthening them and sustaining them. Right? And and so even said, like, are are they, are we suffering? Yes, tremendously. But is there joy? Yes. Because God is with us. Regardless of what we're going through, he's with us and he strengthens us 
and he sustains us as we lean into him in the midst of it. All right, because as followers of Jesus, we go through suffering and loss and difficulty just like anyone else in this life, but our experience of it so often is different because God sustains us in the midst of it as we lean into him. And praying and singing, I th- there are just a couple of ways to do this. And, and even in the, in the funeral, we, we sang songs like, come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing your grace, to sing thy grace. We sang uh, about the goodness of God through all of life. Right? And we gave God praise as we celebrated Chris's life and we thanked God for her as a way to lean into him in the midst of it. And there's something special about that, about singing, right? That, that there are many different ways to lean into God, right? Even, even coming to church like this, praying, uh, spending time in, in scripture and community, but there's also something unique about singing that, that the scriptures point out all throughout. That even Paul himself, we see him doing it here in his practice, but he also writes about it in several places. And I, I just kinda, I wanted to pull some of these together for us this morning. And, and one of the places is in Colossians 3, 16 and 17, where he says, uh, he says this, he says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another. Uh, that, that being the first way that we do it, which is what we're doing here, right? Or in small group. But then the second way is singing singing psalms and hymns in spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God, meaning a way that we let the word of Christ dwell in us, that we let the scriptures shape us is by singing. And he says elsewhere that the singing as an act of worship is a way that we're actually filled with the spirit of God. In Ephesians 5, 18 and 19, he, he puts it like this. He says, be filled with the spirit. And then he says, do that, be filled by addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. And so singing as an act of worship is a way that we are filled with the spirit of God. And the result of that, what happens in our lives when we are filled in that way is, is something he explains in Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23, where he says, but the fruit of the spirit, Regardless of your circumstances, the fruit of the Spirit is love. Right? Meaning even in the midst of the pain, the fruit of the Spirit is joy. Even in the difficulty, it is peace. Even in the pain, it is patience and it's kindness and it's goodness, it's faithfulness, it's gentleness and it's self-control. Meaning all of these qualities are the things that result from us being filled with the spirit of God, which provides some explanation as to why when Paul finds himself in the pitch black middle of the night, inner cell locked in these stocks, he's singing, right? Even though he's bruised and bloodied, he's singing. Even though he can't even move around, he's singing. And even though there is no sign or signal or promise of a release ahead of them, He's singing because it's a way for them to lean into God in the midst of what they're going through and to be filled with the spirit of God, which if you think about it as followers of Jesus, it's common for us to sing at funerals, to worship God in funerals, which if you just step back for a minute, almost seems odd that we would sing and celebrate in that way in, in something that is connected to one of the deepest moments of loss and grief that we experience in this life, that, that we would sing at a time like that. And yet we do so because regardless of what we're going through, we always have reason to give our God praise and to lean into him because as we do so, he strengthens us and he sustains us. And so in light of this passage, and I get that this might feel like a small thing to talk about, but, but the thing I want to ask is just, I just want to ask you to consider what are you listening to? Right? I mean, there's nothing wrong with having a, a wide variety in, in terms of the music that you'd like to listen to, but, but whatever your musical diet consists of, what I'm trying to say is that it might do you some good to have some songs in the mix that point you to God. And that reminds you of his faithfulness and of his kindness and his goodness and his grace in your life. 
right? And there's, there's nothing wrong with other kinds of music, but I'm just saying having some of that in the mix, it does us good. Right? Because if you recall, our response in the midst of whatever it is that we're going through actually does matter beyond just ourselves. Because even as Paul and Silas are singing, the other prisoners are listening. And that's not just some kind of evangelism strategy. They're not singing to be heard. They're singing because they need to. But the byproduct is that other people see that and they hear that. And the same is true of our own lives, that, that there are always people watching and seeing how you respond. My friends, family workers, coworkers, people in the hospital, if that happens to be your situation, even the, the messy little humans that are strapped into your back seat, they're watching because you are where you are for a reason. And one of the key pieces to where you are is the people that surround you. And it's actually to explore that a little bit further that I want to pick up the rest of this story now and move into the second point. So, so let's move into that now. A well-built bridge. A well-built bridge. And just tracking back with the story. So again, it's middle of the night, locked in these stocks, bruised, bloodied, but they're singing and praying and the other prisoners are listening. And it's in the midst of, of one of their songs that an interruption arises. Verse 26. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bonds were unfastened. Right, so in the middle of the night, this earthquake arises and it shakes the foundation and the walls of the prison so severely that even the stocks that, that are holding Paul and Silas are torn out of place and the doors are open, the bonds are loosed and just like that, Right? All of the prisoners are released as the prison doesn't quite collapse, but it's shaken to such an extent that everyone is rendered free in the moment, right? which seems like pretty good news at first, right? at least for Paul and Silas. But what we go on to see in the very next verse is that this is actually not good news for everyone. Verse 27, when the jailer meaning the person who's ultimately responsible for overseeing the prison, not the only one, but, but the ultimate one responsible. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. Because for him, this was terrible news because it meant that he had failed in his responsibility. And even though the thing that set the prisoners free was insane, right? it was an earthquake, something he had no control over, it didn't matter. He would still be held responsible. And he could choose to either face the punishment himself, right, which was death and was probably done in a fashion that was public and intended to shame him for his failure, or he could choose to handle things himself right then and there which is exactly what he intended to do until someone intervened. Verse 28. But Paul cried with a loud voice saying, do not harm yourself for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in the lights being brought by the other people working with him and trembling with fear. He fell down before Paul and Silas, recognizing that he owed them his life. Then he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? He asked them a couple weeks ago, Josh talked about people who are ready to be found. And the truth is you don't find people who are much more ready than this right here, where he's asking them, he's inviting them to explain the gospel to him. But the thing to notice is that he doesn't start here in the story. But, but there's a series of circumstances that lead him to this place. And, and that's really what I want to look at together here that uh, he and I want to touch on two pieces, right? The first is the circumstances that lead to the question. And the second is the nature of the question itself. Right, so the circumstances and then the nature of the question. And when it comes to the circumstances, what I want us to see is that before the question is raised, there's some groundwork that has to take place here. There's some relational work that has to be done, right? And, and it's because this kind of a conversation, uh, 
This kind of question is typically only raised in a serious way in a relationship that has trust. And trust typically isn't built overnight. With Paul and Silas, because of the severity of the situation, it happens in a moment. But, but even with them, if you break down the pieces, you see that, that the trust is formed because they put their own necks on the line for this jailer. Because if they hadn't convinced everyone else to stay and to stay themselves when they had every incentive to go, this man would be dead. His life would be over. But, but they stuck their necks out on the line for him, for his sake, and convinced everyone else to stay as well. And when they did that for him, that meant something. That earned his trust and it earned his attention. Right? And if we were to just break that down a little bit, um, I think a good summary of this, and, and I, I, this is not my line. Uh, this is a quote I'm borrowing from another preacher, but I thought it was good enough to use here. So, uh, but this is what, this is what he did. they did. They built a relational bridge that was strong enough to sustain the weight of the gospel. They built a relational bridge that was strong enough to sustain the weight of the gospel. I thought that was good enough to, to borrow. So, um, but if you think about it, they had to form trust before the question would arise, before they could have the conversation. And I think what this means for us is that, you know, street evangelism is kind of its own thing. And I think that's good in its own way. But when it comes to the people who are a regular part of our lives, sometimes the most helpful thing is not to just rush into uh, the very first time we're meeting someone to rush in with the gospel, because I think that can actually hinder the chance that we have for a deeper relationship sometimes. And sometimes it's helpful to first just show some genuine care and concern for the other person. And to begin to build a relationship and establish trust first. Right? And let me be clear, it's not that you're making this into a project, right? Because it's not like your goal is to convert someone and then just move on to the next person. But a part of what Jesus tells us to do in the Gospels is, is to love our neighbor like ourselves. Right? But, but to love our neighbor. And part of the way that we do that is by having spiritual conversations and sharing the gospel, but also just by showing up in relationships to someone who genuinely cares for other people and is concerned for their well-being and is encouraging. Right? And, and so we need to build relationships first sometimes before we rush into conversations on faith to establish some trust there. But at a certain point, we do need to get there because that is a way that we love people as well. And I think sometimes, you know, I get that that can be intimidating to introduce a conversation on faith or, or even bring the gospel up in a conversation. I, and honestly, it is for me too, right? That's not the easiest thing in the world to do. But, but let me just say, sometimes I think we overcomplicate it and that it can actually be a whole lot simpler than we realize, that, that it can be as easy as just saying when someone asks you what you did over the weekend, that you went to church and that that was something that was meaningful to you. Because some of the people that, that you work alongside of, and this is probably no secret to you, but, but some of them, they've probably never even had a friend that they know of who follows Jesus. And to them, somebody who's a Christian is just something completely off base. They, it's, it's a foreign concept. They've never met one in real life. And so in the context of a relationship, we're able to show how following Jesus is something that leads us to be people who are grounded and who have care and concern for other people and who seek the best of those who are around us. And the thing is, I don't know who that might be for you or who the person or a couple of people are that you have a chance to develop a relationship with. But I will say this. You are where you are for a reason. And you have the chance to build trust and to develop a relationship and eventually to share the gospel with people who in a million years would never come and listen to me right? because they're not interested in what some preacher has to say, but they will listen to you when they know that you care because you are where you are for a reason. And you may be the only opportunity this person has to ever have a relationship and a friendship with someone who knows and follows Jesus. And the only chance they have to hear and respond to the gospel. 
And so we build relational bridges that can sustain the way to the gospel. Right? And then maybe the follow-up question is, well, what does it look like to cross that bridge? Or how do you know when the moment is, when, when that's something that you're supposed to do? And to some extent, I do think that's something that the Spirit of God leads us in, that there's a, a nudging that you feel in the moment where, uh, honestly, it'll be very clear that this is something you're supposed to step out into and join God in. But uh, to, to get a little bit more of an answer, I also want to just explore the nature of this question itself, that, that this Philippian jailer, he asked the question, what must I do to be saved? And that, even the way that he uses that language and he phrases it in that specific way, that shows that he has some understanding of Paul's teaching uh, prior to this point. Either this is a longer conversation and Paul only gives us the question, or uh, he had heard Paul's teaching earlier in the city of Philippi, but, but however he was familiar with it, he knew enough to phrase the question in this way. He knew that there was something that he needed to be saved from, right? and that shaped the question. But the thing is, I want to draw our attention to that because I think for most of us, we rarely, if ever, hear the question in this particular way, using this language. Uh, that doesn't happen all that often, but even with that being the case, I think we actually do hear this kind of question, this kind of invitation to introduce faith more often than we realize. Because instead of sounding like, like the way that he phrased it, what must I do to be saved? It sounds like, uh, there were some phrases that Josh even shared just a couple of weeks ago. It sounds like, I, I just feel like I'm lost. Right? Or I, I don't know how to get a sense of direction for my life, or, or I'm tired of feeling like I never measure up, or I just want to feel loved and accepted. Or sometimes it's even more specific than that. It's a question around a specific area of life. And it could be something like, you know, how do you know when a person is the right one to marry? How did you know? Or how do you go about navigating your career with all these opportunities that, you know, what do you say yes to? What do you say no to? How do you, what do you pursue? What do you not? What are the things that help you to navigate making these decisions? How do you do that? Because the thing is, people make statements and they ask questions all the time that express this sense of frustration and this uncertainty over how to navigate life. And... And as followers of Jesus, these are an opportunity for us to show how our faith isn't just something kind of superficially tacked on to the external pieces of our lives, but, but it's something that shapes us, right? It shapes even the most significant pieces of our lives, and it's what leads us to navigate our lives in the ways that we do, right? That our faith is the thing that grounds us and that leads us. And so when it comes to having that particular conversation, I really do think that it's something the Spirit of God leads us in and guides us in. And, and, and when the moment comes to cross that bridge, I, I, don't, I, don't, I think you'll know very clearly. But let me just say this. If, if God is making it very clear in the moment that he wants you to step out and introduce the subject of faith in this or that way, then all you need to do is trust him and step out into that. And as you do, he will continue to be with you and he will guide you in the conversation and give you the words to speak. Because all you need to do is step out. Because if I think even in my own life, it was someone sharing stories like this of, of ways that God had worked in his life, right? It was a friend of mine, a coworker. And one day out of the blue, he just began to share stories with me of of how God had challenged him and directed him and even expressed his love to him and how meaningful that was to him. And, and honestly, I had heard of people talking about a relationship with God. I had never heard anyone actually uh, explain that in a way where God was an active agent in the relationship. I had never heard anything like that. But as he began to share story after story with me, it, it was something I had never heard before. And eventually that conversation led into the gospel. And, and it was because he was willing to do that, that my life will forever be different. Because he built a relational bridge that was strong enough to sustain the weight of the gospel. And when the opportunity arose, he crossed. Right? And what I'm trying to say is that when we do the same, 
God, when we're intentional to build relationships, to listen well, and to step out in faith when God is leading us, incredible things can follow. I, and, and as we get ready to close, let me just, let me just say that, that we can see that from so many of our own lives, our own stories and testimonies, but we can also see it even from this own passage. Right? As the Philippian jailer poses this question to Paul and Silas, and they then respond. And this is what happens. Verse 31. And they said, Paul and Silas said to him, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house, to his entire family. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once. He and all his family, all of them coming to faith in Jesus Christ. And then he brought them up into his house and set food before them. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. This man, along with his entire family, came to faith in Jesus Christ because they were willing when the opportunity arose to step out and to cross the bridge with the gospel. Right? And the point is, we all have the opportunity to do the same because you are where you are for a reason so that the same might be true for somebody else through you. Would you bow your heads with me? And I just wanna give you a moment to consider who God might have placed around you in your own life and who he might be leading you to begin to build a relationship with. Yeah, Jesus, we thank you that we are where we are for a reason. We thank you that you do give us direction and guidance in our lives. We thank you that you challenge us and encourage us, that you do express your love to us in ways that are so tangible and concrete. And we ask that you would give us courage, that you would give us strength, that you would sustain us, and that you would enable us to continue to step out uh, into whatever it is that you're calling us to. And that in the midst of whatever it is that we're going through, that we would be able to lean into you for strength, for joy, and for peace. We love you and we praise you. In your precious name, amen.